Okay, this is <clears throat> this is the pre-class video for RPH 140 World Philosophies class number 20 um, for Monday, August 7th. All right, the first thing I want to say is that unless all of you over the weekend have done caught up on your work, um, you need to figure out how to get it incomplete because according to the syllabus, you're going to all start getting Fs because you're not handing this stuff in. And the reason I am upset is that my other class, I did the same thing. I kept saying, I trust you. I know you have a lot of work to do, but they didn't do it. And so they're handing things to me that were due two months ago. And suddenly, and they never had any time to do it until suddenly they could hand in eight assignments in a day or two days. And that's, it's intellectually dishonest and it's a betrayal of trust. Because if you had time to do the whole class in one day, you certainly had time to do it when it was due. So I'm not listening to that, right? I'm really disappointed because I trusted students and they betrayed me. <laughs> they used and abused the trust. So if you truly haven't had time to do any of the assignments up to now, you will not have time to do them by the due date. So you need to find a way to get an incomplete. And I've written to the provost and I could write once more, but it isn't my responsibility. <laughs> but, you know, once again, the students I have have a lot to do. That's why I have a lot of mercy for them. But, when they betray that, that's it. I, I drew the line in the sand. I'm not gonna take a bunch of bullshit that you just wrote at the last minute because you realized, you know, so uh, find a way and I will grade what I get. Um, but if you hand everything in the night before, it's going to be a C at best. And that is, it should be an F according to the syllabus. Okay. Now let's do the um, material for today, for Monday. First of all, I only had you read one long article, which is way less than I usually assign for two and a half days. The class in general is maybe two thirds of a, what it usually is. Um, all right, so we have been working on Islam and the article on Purda, we still have to finish the article on Purda. And if you haven't read it before, you should come to class having read it. Um, my main point there, usually I dress up like an imam and I say, we don't want your Western women. We don't apologize for segregating our women. And we think you're disgusting by letting your women dress any way they want, do anything they want. And that's the source of the decline of your civilization. That's why you are going to self-destruct. That's why. Um, the Quran is right. The message from God was that Jesus died too soon. And he did it so that Christians were not given guidance, day-to-day -day guidance about how to love God, love your neighbor as yourself, how to follow God's commands or God's uh, idea of how a, a God-loving person should live and that's why 
Gabriel, God sent Gabriel to Muhammad because then Muhammad had a, a life where he got married. He was a businessman. He was a leader. He engaged in all those roles. He played all those roles. He was a role model and he developed the five pillars and all those things. So when we see the degenerate Western women and the degenerate Western society where capitalism is driving Americans into the ground, we say, yes, that's, a, that's why Islam should take over the world. It seems totally obvious to us. And so what are, what, why do we have this sexual segregation, right? First of all, what is it? It's um, you keep, you prevent women from interacting with men. Um, they are segregated in different physical locations. Their bodies are covered. There's a psychological um, segregation, right? Women are not, are taught not to be aggressive, to depend on men, to marry and follow the roles as wife and mother. Um, okay, so the spaces that they go in, marriage, the expectations. Okay, so here. This is the main point of why people even today will justify it, right? They'll say, in a poor country, we can't, we have to make sure that every baby, a married, every time a woman gets pregnant, she's married and the husband knows that this is his kid, right? We can't have premarital sex. We can't have extramarital sex. And we don't want it either. It's degenerate. So we honor marriage and we honor women. And they have babies that are biologically the father's babies. And then the inheritance they have will be passed on to their own children. Very important. Um, PERDA also enables people to have sexual self-control because men, women also, but especially men, and especially because of patriarchy, they have a chemical trigger reaction to seeing virtually naked women's bodies. And that's just part of their psyche. There are all sorts of studies done on this. <laughs> How many seconds go by when uh, men don't talk, don't think about sex? Uh, I'm not going to say what the study said because I can't. It's how on earth would you um, <laughs> would you be able to survey a person who would give you an honest answer? I just think sex and sex attraction play a role in people's lives. Obviously, it's like hunger plays a role in people's lives. Thirst, people are aware of those basic drives and needs. And having women dress in whatever they, way they want just aggravates that part of the brain and keeps people focused on it more than they otherwise would be, okay? They can, they can think about something else besides sex. They can even maybe want to, but if they're constantly bombarded with these sexual triggers, um, it makes it a lot harder. It also leads to people that are internally conflicted. They don't have integrity and um, it, turns people into either being self-indulgent, so they start acting on their impulses, or they're very rigid and self-righteous. So you get fundamentalists, either in Christianity or Judaism or Islam, any religion, people are self-righteous 
are obviously repressing their desires and they're blaming the person who's triggering them, right? So it, it, having women dress in ways that don't show their bodies enables people to have more integrity, more emotional integrity, to think about emotions other than sexual attraction. Another important part of PERDA is childcare. It ensures that every child is cared for and cared for by the mother. Um, and in America, that's not true. Like the most stressed out people are mother with mothers with small children. Children go into daycare at a very young age. They're cared for by people they do not know. They, they have no long-term connection to. And that's the way we really develop character is that we have long-term connections to people. We develop a life history. We have a history of our knowledge of our parents, our grandparents, our extended family. We come to know ourselves. That way we get molded and in turn mold other people. Those are real connections that create a real history. But in America, the, the worship of individuality is you send your kid to childcare, you send them here, you send them there. And nobody you know, has any commitment to culture. It's all designed to make people good consumers because they, they feel inadequate, right? Nobody knows their character. So now you have to obsess about what you look like. And everybody knows how big your house is, how expensive your car is. So you have a whole culture based on appearances because people don't know each other's characters and they don't have long-term relationships. So the, those, the relationships they do have would tend to break down. And so what have you got left? Stuff, except that by the time you're on your deathbed, everybody regrets that they stayed in the office so long or that they bought stuff because you can't take it with you. So they regret that they didn't have relationships. Anyway, so PERDA ensures child care. It ensures elder care. We don't want Westerners model of old folks home where once again, you're cared for by people you don't even know. We think it's disgusting. And you, you have all sorts of research about why this is not healthy and it's not what people want, but it makes tons of money. Um, we're not apologizing for PERDA. We have a lot of reasons to be proud of it and to keep it. Um, there is a division of labor, right? The man is the breadwinner, the woman is the caregiver. We have uh, inheritance goes from the father to the son. There has to be some organized pattern of inheritance. Um, but the Quran says, that daughters inherit half of what their sons inherit. So even with PERDA, even with that other uh, division of labor, women are not destitute and they do inherit property. Um, all right, you have to make sure that the children a man takes care of are his biological children. Um, impulse control, okay. So these are stereotypes from the past. So I, as a contemporary Muslim who supports Purda, I don't have to believe um, that female sexuality is insatiable and it, it destroys culture. I can accept that it's not what people used to think it was, but even your modern science electrodes on the brain says that men have a sexual reaction to 
the women around them who are dressed in any sort of provocative way. That's not backward or primitive. That's as a matter of fact. And you, we think you have a fake culture. Like your society is not a culture because it doesn't weave people together. It keeps setting them apart in a million different ways. It nurtures looking at people as sex objects. It promotes people being ambitious and competitive, moving away from home for a better job, getting disconnected from other people. It just keeps feeding that, rewarding that. What matters is how much money you have. Um, that's my main point. It's not that I still believe women's sexuality, sexuality is so insatiable. Um, then you have the problem of honor, honor killings, that it's very important. It is very important to us that young girls maintain their virginity. But if you have PERDA, that should not be a problem. Um, and there are exceptions, right? Girls who get raped and then they get killed or they're dishonored, people won't marry them. Um, that still happens. I know that as a matter of fact. But that's not the main point of PERDA and it's not the main benefit of PERDA. And there are imams who would work around that, right? If a girl does get raped, there are people who will support her and prevent her from being marginalized or demonized for that. There was the custom of making sure that the, on the wedding night that the bride is a virgin, okay, and that was, um, I'm not defending that, that was a tradition long ago. The legal system, some of the legal systems are explicitly misogynist, but in a lot of countries today, excuse me, today, some countries are based on Sharia law, and that's Saudi Arabia, but you can defend Perda and still have a country like Indonesia, that's technically a democratic country, but every citizen has to register as belonging to one relig religious tradition. And there's a lot of different choices, but if you register as Muslim, then there are family laws and mar marriage laws that apply particularly to Muslims. Um, they don't apply to if you are a different religion. There are some issues where women actually have legal protection, but they don't know about it. Um, I'm not defending that. Um, I, can't, I can't defend everything. I can't defend the corruptions. I'm just basically defending the idea and the general trend. And we do not want Western westernized women. We don't want that kind of society. Um, the Quran was very progressive and there, it's perfectly uh, acceptable, even a better uh, interpretation of the Quran, Muhammad's behavior, Muhammad's intentions to come out at the end of the day with a very progressive egalitarian view of uh, how a Muslim should treat women. Um, then it's clear that every aspect of PERDA is undermined. The United Nations Declaration of uh, Universal Human Rights is, um, is oriented toward the future. Okay, so there are many Muslim countries, in, including Indonesia, that has signed on with the United Nations Declaration. Um, and we don't apologize for that. Like we, we're happy, actually. We are eager to fit to um, follow those principles. 
But still, if our citizens register as Muslims, then there are Muslim laws and there are Muslim judges who uh, enforce those laws and apply those laws. And as long as there's no egregious violation of the constitution, we give them a right, right? Religious freedom, which is something that Americans are arguing about now. Um, all right. One reason a country like Indonesia would want to move toward the United Nations is because they, if they want their society to develop, they, can, they should limit their family size so that every child can get educated. And that's fine. It's just that you could still have PERDA. And <laughs> that's not inconsistent with PERDA. Um, okay. So, um, so in this in this paper that you read, the, the author starts out claiming to be fair, right? Claiming to say that. Um, that there are reasons for PERDA, right? And then in the second half of the paper, she explains, but it violates all of these rights, right? Well, that's the presupposition that we, we agree with all of those rights in the first place, which we don't. Um, but my argument is that it's, there are lots of good reasons for having PERDA even though, you know, the great Westerners um, condemn it uh, completely, right? It goes totally against their set of values. Well, insofar as it goes against what they perceive as their values, we would call those, those very behaviors the source of moral decline and the reason that God sent Gabriel to speak, to recite the Quran to Muhammad. So you just have to settle for it. And then in class on Monday, we'll all talk about it. I want you to have come prepared, ready to talk about that article and about Purga. Okay, the next thing is terrorism, right? Islam and terrorism. So I was in Indonesia and all of these articles here are pretty much related to my experience in Indonesia, which I think was, I mean, I'm so grateful I could do it. And I hope that you are as amazed by some of this stuff as I am. So I was asked to speak about terrorism at a conference, as I said, and I said, well, I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know much, you know. And you all know a lot more than I know. And they said, yeah, but we want an international conference. So you have to be on, you have to make a presentation. <laughs> so my um, method was simply to take Aristotle's virtues and apply that to to the idea that a country where the people are exercising the virtues is going to be much more resilient against terrorism. And a country where people are self-indulgent, greedy, you name it, degenerate, is going to be much more vulnerable to terrorism in a number of ways. First of all, if they're greedy and they think money, so they will create resentment and envy. So people will want to attack them. On the other hand, because of their greed, they will want to attack another country. So you instantly have animosity with every other country, which of course aggravates terrorism. Then um, you have within a country, you have um, people competing economically, and also you have um, demonizing people within your country, right? That's a terrorist. And you can, I mean, in, our, in the case of America, 
Muslim, like every Muslim is all of a sudden a terrorist. And so that divides the country into pieces. But if you maintain the virtues and you always look at the virtues, you'll know that Muslim Americans exercise virtue as much or more, whatever, as anybody else in the country. There's no difference if you look through the lens of virtue. My guess would be that on average, they're probably better than the average American because Americans feel entitled to being here and to getting what they want without having to work for it or to being considered virtuous without having to prove it because they're white skinned or their ancestors came here 200 years ago. So therefore they're superior or they're more virtuous. No way. So that would tend to make privileged white people less virtuous. So they would have to even be more careful and more self correcting because they have to make sure they don't cut themselves some slack just because of advantages that they were born with. Um, okay, so the worst when, I mean, the one thing, the worst political evil is greed for Aristotle. Major issue when it comes to terrorism. All major religious and philosophical positions condemn it. It causes all these problems. All right. So I've already, it causes a shrinking middle class. So it causes animosity within a country and between countries, right? The trade agreements are tainted by resentment or rather than cooperation. Fear, that's the next thing, right? Obviously, are, how do you, how are you resilient against terrorism? How is it that the virtue of courage, knowing when to be afraid and when not to be afraid, right? Because if you're too afraid, you're going to go attack and then, then you will be hated and you'll be more vulnerable. If you're not afraid of not enough, of course, you can get attacked. Um, but greed tends to lead people to thinking that other countries hate them even more than they actually do. <laughs> so it would tend to make them overreact, be too afraid and then too violent. Um, politicians can feed that fear of enemies, right? And say, you're not patriotic if you don't fear terrorists or whoever, communists or them, or the hordes coming from somewhere else. Okay, then you have the problem that military people, some of them just want power, makes them feel important. So they will really believe that we have to have more power. On the other hand, the military contractors, that's where greed corrupts uh, our military and our ability to make good judgments about who to fear and who not to fear. Um, is that there's a profit motive. And so when it comes, when the Congress is, is uh, deciding on military spending each year, I guarantee all the lobbyists come in from all those military contractors, Boeing and all these, honestly, like the city is flooded with lobbyists. And then they say, oh, how much do you want for your political campaign? And so we still, we're making like B1 bombers that cost a billion bucks a piece. And that is not the kind of wars we're fighting. We're fighting cyber wars and like boots on the ground Afghanistan. We're not fighting wars that require B1 bombers. That was Russia. <laughs> Why do we still, you know, why does our government still contract with these companies? Because they want to make money and they don't want to change. Okay, so let me give you an example <laughs> that the companies, there was one year or something, we got some B-1 bombers cut from our uh, apportionments, right? The, the um, bill 
All right, so guess what? Then we have this wall being constructed between us and Mexico. Guess who was given the contract to build the wall? <laughs> of course, that same company. You don't give me my B-1 bomber. Oh, well, I'll give you this wall contract. It's like, <laughs> hey guys, you know, it's kind of interesting to find out what's going on under the surface, all right? So then you could say, well, it provides jobs. Look, first we decide what we really need, then we'll provide jobs. We really need to go green, that will provide jobs. What you're really saying is we don't wanna change. And that is fatal, right? That's killing us. There will be jobs. It's just that people have to change their jobs because the world has changed. Uh, COVID should make it clear to everybody. The world has changed. Let's change. Um, fear is used to motivate people to sign up for the military. So now we have a professional military. When we had a volunteer, I mean, uh, uh, draft. That was when Vietnam War, that's why you had all the protests, because people had, well, feared getting drafted, or they did. But if you have a professional military, and you give, for many people, their best career option is to sign up for military, you're not going to get people questioning, why are we going to war? What? How much are we spending on what? in the military, right? $2,200 per person, that's a lot of money. Where is it going? The military does not have to run an audit. They don't have to tell anybody what they're spending their money on. Okay, anyway, fear drives this. All this dysfunction is because people are afraid or politicians keep uh, feeding those excess fears. Um, okay, and if you criticize anybody who keeps promoting war, then you're not patriotic, right? Um, there's the fear of the inability, right? Fear of lack of jobs. So if your country values money, then you're that much more afraid of losing jobs. That's why we can make B-1 bombers as long as it keeps jobs. So that's a button, jobs is a button instead of what job and why you know you have to be in a much better frame of mind before you can figure out how to adjust the economy to the actual needs of people to create a middle class you have to step back and fear is one of the main reasons people don't um if you fear your fe fellow citizens, right, then you end up with more police officers and more uh, people in prison. We have an incredible percentage of our population, way more than other countries, and it costs tons of money. And then we don't have money for childcare, after school, anything with quality of life, and anything to prevent children from growing up to be criminals. We don't do anything about forming character because we keep thinking that's an individual right. Parents have an individual right and responsibility to raise their kids the way they want. Well, if you can't get a house in a decent neighborhood and you can't get childcare, you're not, and you have to go to work, you're not gonna be able to raise your child the way you want. But so it just leaves you with toxic environments. Then you end up with more crime. Oh, really? And it costs more money. So, so that whole, but fear, just that running a society on fear also makes us more vulnerable to outside attacks because we're so preoccupied with each other. So, um, According to the FBI, the, the number one terrorist problem is internally, right? It's the white supremacists are considered the worst terrorists, uh, you know, and we have a lot of other people to worry about 
It's just that our own people have siphoned off all of our resources. So we don't have the money to go green or to prevent problems or to have education. It's just this obsession, this violence and lack, lack of trust and fear within our own country. Um, then we have, of course, the fear of not being able to have, not be able to be rich or not be able to get a fancy car so you show everybody how successful you are. All that stuff is really undermining our internal stability. Fear of sickness, uh, moral courage, you have to overcome. Fear of speaking out and getting ostracized. Uh, political courage, politicians fear telling the citizens the truth because they'll lose the next election. Um, and, and they don't, they have to decide then which matters more. If they could tell the truth and then lose the election, but, but the truth has been out there and the public knows. Or if they just keep going along and keep feeding people's irrational pleasures and fears. Um, okay, prevents people from demanding accountability. And then the Patriot Act, that's what happened after 9-11. Um, it was passed, it was like 250 pages and passed in like two days. Like none of the legislators read it, but they knew that they had to pass it or they wouldn't get reelected, right? The people were demanding and the people don't care apparently. And then they found out after it was passed, wow, this is a lot of government surveillance. Well, yeah, but there's a difference between government surveillance, like tapping your phones and government telling you you should get a vaccine or wear a mask, right? Vaccines and masks are about public health. Tapping your phone <laughs> is about um, privacy. It's about um, you being um, getting into trouble, right? You being marginalized or harmed in some way just because of something you said on the phone. That does not have to do with public health or public safety. Um, it, I mean, there, the rules about tap phone wire, uh, phone tapping said that the government can tap a phone immediately if they think it's important, but they have to report it within 30 days or something. In other words, so the government can't secretly tap your phone for anything. It has to be accountable, okay? But after the pa Patriot Act, I think they even removed that. I mean, it, it got ridiculously um, severe and gave the government way more power, but it had nothing to do with creating a middle class. It had everything to do with centralization of power, which was a major issue during the Bush administration. The presidency was restructured to be a lot more powerful. So, the Patriot Act was just one part of a, a real switch that happened during the Bush administration. Um, and the people were more willing to go along with it because of 9-11. Um, all right, so then generosity. Generosity creates a middle class, binds people together, makes them more resilient against terrorism from the outside or terrorism from the inside. People trust each other more. Uh, magnificence, that helps to, to create a social fabric. Um, uh, let's see, supporting, okay, so I can. Even temperedness, very important. Um, so that, that's what happened to Americans. Right after we overreacted. Um, so our rulers, the day after said, we have to tie this to Saddam, even though they knew Saddam was not the cause. There were no Al-Qaeda in, in Iraq. He was a secular ruler. He and Al-Qaeda did not get along. But 
the Bush administration had wanted to attack Iraq for cheap oil ever since H.W. Bush didn't finish the job. And so they used it as an excuse. And they said they used it. That's all documented. Americans didn't know it then. They don't know it now. And right after 9-11, 71% said revenge is fine. Let's go for it. So first they cry. Everybody cries and feels sorry for themselves. And then revenge, right? No. Self-pity? No. There was a reason those people did that, and Americans should have known that. No, instead, they just feel sorry for themselves, and then they get mad. All right. Um, okay, so we started to become a role model for taking revenge. Everybody else in the world, oh, okay, I can do that too. Um, even when everybody else in the world knew that Saddam didn't cause it, okay? So, but then they learned from our leaders how to, how to lie to the public in order to start a war or start animosity. Um, okay, there's a reason, right? A lot of the terrorists are young people with no future. You should find out about that. Rational humor can help people become less afraid and can, again, make us more resilient because we don't overreact, right? Um, sociability would be important to make us more resilient. Rational ambition is important so that we have the right people in the FBI, the CIA, the military, the diplomacy, all these layers of professionalism that we need in order to uh, be resilient against terrorism, right? We need a whole lot of FBI, CIA spotting where these terrorist uh, cells are. Then we need a whole lot of them. The police uh, and the FBI within our country spotting them to prevent problems. Um, uh, if we, the degree to which we have people in positions based on merit, We'll have a stable society. We'll trust each other. If in all, you're, I mean, you're dealing with people all the time. People fix your car. People um, uh, collect your taxes, right? The IRS. People mow your lawn. People clean your house. Every, every case, they have to be competent and trustworthy, right? All, there's so many ways that we really need a meritocracy. We really depend on each other to be good at what we're paying them to do and to be honest, right? Okay, when the people in power, any kind of power are unqualified, dishonest, right? Degenerate or well-intentioned, but simply unqualified, everything starts to fall apart. Um, we also have to um, recognize people who go above and beyond to prevent terrorism. Um, there are soldiers that we have out in the field uh, all over the world. And some of them really do incredibly honorable things that are, go way above and beyond what they would need to do. Um, Tammy Duckworth, for example, is a U.S. congressperson. Uh, her relatives came over from Cambodia. I think. She got hit by a, a bomb in, the, I don't know, it was Afghanistan or Iraq. She is in a wheelchair now, but she said she was just lying there and didn't know if anybody would come help her. So her fellow comrades came right? They risked their lives for her. And that was very honorable, right? I don't know if they ever got officially honored, but she did take that opportunity when she was interviewing to say that, right? Um, there's so, that was after, that was actually when um, Donald Trump said that military people are suckers and losers, <laughs> you know, 
if that's what you want, you're president, fine. I think most people would say that would, isn't why they voted for him. But, you know, he did say that. Um, rhetoric is, uh, is really important to cut through the rhetoric. That's so important. Obviously, you know that. And again, that's a major factor in making a country less resistant to terrorism because of the way rhetoric can get used. Tax, the tax system, legislation, how do you create the right legislation, um, criminal justice system, distribution. So it's, you know, all the same qualities of a society that would help people flourish are the same characteristics that would make it more resilient against terrorism. So I, you know, it sounds like a broken record, but otherwise it just looks like life is one problem after another and there's no pattern to it. It's just a crapshoot what's gonna happen to you. And that's not true. I think whatever problem comes up, you can go back to these basic patterns in life because they're there, they just sit there there's always the need for rational ambition, rational honor. There's always, you know, when you have a problem, you say, is that because the person in charge wasn't qualified, that they were put in that position because their daddy had a lot of money or because they paid money to a political campaign and basically bribed themselves into the position. Um, you know, there's, you could always, it's going to come back to these questions. And that's what I want. That's why I don't mind saying it over and over because I say it over and over to myself. But that's what I habitually ask these kinds of questions. And, you know, you can get somewhere. You have, then you have to go get information, but you can figure out where it fits in the system. Um, you can't let the legal system be controlled by the rich. That's obviously a huge problem. Then the intellectual virtues, right? We have to have a lot of people in the forensic sciences, right? Finding terrorist groups. I mean, right now, cyber attacks, right? Instead of boots on the ground war, instead of airplane wars, the real wars are occurring online. And so we do need a whole cyber military, right? It's very important. And we need the hack, right? Hackers to people fighting against hackers. The Russians are really good at hacking. And they, you know, they can destroy our country in ways other than traditional military. So we are developing a whole sector, a whole network of government employees who work on protecting us from attack and their attacks on our elections, but their attacks on our infrastructure, attacks on you know any aspect of our computer world. Um, so let's see, those, so, okay. After there are attacks, we need to gather together with our allies. We did not do that after 9-11. So practical wisdom, respond in a critical situation. Um, so this is what happened at 9-11. We did not respond well, right? Then whatever your idea of God, um, no one should use a particular religious belief to justify violence, right? Terrorism. Um, Aristotle's model is one way. And then I, I, the context of this paper was Indonesia's um, Declaration of Independence. And you don't have to read that section. It might be interesting to you. But then right toward the end, cultural diversity, there's more than one kind of democracy. Indonesians should be the best Indonesians they can be. They don't have to be like America. Um, all right, so I do want you to read that article. That's a major, that's the main assignment. Then, um, 
fatalism. There were some other really interesting things that I, I went to these conferences and here's the, here's the issue is a scholar was writing about um, religion and fatalism. So he was referring to the huge tsunami in Indonesia. I don't know, again, if you remember, it was a while ago, but it just wiped out a whole lot of people in Aceh was one section of um, Indonesia. And I actually went and saw that area and there was a map of um, what the area looked like before. And here's this map and here's where this um, mosque is located on the map. And I look and it's like all ocean. <laughs> so after the tsunami, it literally chewed up miles of what used to be land. And now it just like looks like ocean. And um, yeah, I knew people, there were other scholars I was with and they knew people whose relatives had gotten wiped out. Um, yeah, anyway, 9-11 is another one. So religion, um, I talked to some of my colleagues and they said the tsunami was just a test of our faith to see if we still believed in God or the tsunami was um, a judgment to Indonesia because Indonesia is trying to be progressive and it's secular and it's giving women rights. And so that's why God sent the tsunami. <laughs> okay, now that means you aren't gonna use your reason to figure it out. There were other editorials that said, if Americans had paid 25% more, 25 cents more in taxes, we could have had this whole international system that would have sensors for earthquakes under the water and all those people could have gotten out of there. So there's different approaches to problems, right? And one of them, the one in Aristotle's virtues, is to have you know trained professionals at all these levels to prevent problems. With a tsunami, to have scientifically trained people, technology to prevent the problems. Okay, so religion, in some cases, it makes people more vulnerable because they don't use reason to address the problems and then they stay vulnerable. In other cases, or in other respects, it makes them resilient because they pick up and carry on, right? And they don't just fall apart. But the same thing happens in the US, right? Resilience, the capacity to withstand loss, right? Or to prevent loss. That's what I was talking about with terrorism. How do you develop a society that can prevent be resilient in both those ways. And the US completely failed in all of that stuff. Um, the secular responses, um, okay. So those are things to think about for you to think about because these things will happen in your lifetime. Definitely we will have another terrorist attack, I'm sure. We will have wars for resources. We will have all sorts of climate events. So you do need to think about how you wanna think about them and how you want to um, talk to other people about these issues. This one is about um, the problem of young people joining terrorist organizations. And again, I'm listening to this and thinking, this is exactly what happens in the US. Okay, so extremists, uh, no, what happens is um, in high schools, there are clubs, right? And some of those, some of them are religious clubs and some of them are pretty conservative religious clubs. So they say, if you join our club, it means you really wanna get back to Islam. You wanna get back to morals 
You want to get back to self-control, temperance, traditional Christian slash Muslim values, right? Oh, good. You join this club. Everybody, you know, um, is self-controlled. They tend to be pretty authoritarian clubs, right? Everybody's sort of in lockstep because that's how you're going to get yourself and your country back on board, back to God. And you're going to set an example. Well, then from that group, there's uh, terrorist organizations try to pick, you know, they, the leaders in those groups sort of figure out which kids might actually agree to risk their lives for God. And then those kids get recommended to the terrorists, right? So it's kind of a recruiting tool. Um, now, does a mild for, milder form of that happen uh, in our country where there are, uh, you know, white supremacists or, or um, other hate groups? There are African-American hate groups. They obviously aren't as active as the white ones at this point in time anyway. Um, and so how do you, how do you prevent them from growing, right? And from undermining social stability and resilience. Um, so I do think there's so many similarities. There's similarities between all the religions, obviously, but it's, it seems even more so between Christianity and Islam. Um, maybe because I was in Indonesia, but there, I mean, you no. Know, the same stories, they're very similar, they're cousins. So you should think about that. Um, then, or they're half brothers, they're not even cousins. They're like half brothers. They have the same father. All right, so this is uh, another approach, another way to think about these, the themes of the class that was presented by a doctor in Little Rock, Arkansas, who came from, I think, Syria. And um, I went to a conference of the um, AMC International, which is an international organization that protects political people who are oppressed for their political stances. Um, okay, so what he says, this is the speaker believes these things. We're, we all belong to the same species. He accepts evolution. Um, and he says, religions, culture and religion are manifestations of humans um, as the same right to exist as long as they respect human dignity, right? Um, religions are important, they're fine. And cultural differences except you have to respect this basic human dignity. What is identity? And so you can think about your identity. What do you think of as your identity? Usually it includes a whole lot of stuff. Certain elements are fixed, others are acquired and they can change. Why do humans need identity? Cooperation. They need to know who they can depend on. Um, originally, it was the tribe, well, it was a family, tribe, but then it keeps expanding, right? But in these more tribal groups can get competitive and lead to conflict. Um, so we need a collective identity. Originally, they're tribal, but they can expand. Um, all right, people tend to feel attacked right, in terms of some aspect of their identity, and then they react. That's why the Arab world is an example of how identity politics is leading to major wars. Um, it gets reinforced through a long process of indoctrination. Um, religions are a major molding factor in identity. The structures of religion, the dogmas and the myths, the rituals. These are the things where everybody's different. And then these are the, and then 
there's also aspects of your religion's principles that are shared. So, of course, I'm emphasizing the shared ones. Uh, how it becomes an instrument of crime, fear, right? Um, is the most powerful creator of panic and irrational behavior. Okay, what started as just people cooperating, wanting to get together, turns into this uh, war and a religious justification for war. So we need to create a new identity, says we need to identify as all of humanity. And of course, this class is designed to keep getting you back to pleasure, pain, and fear, you know, um, temperance, courage, generosity, even temperedness. Every society, this is just part of being a human being. And so I thought it was interesting that he said a lot of the same things I see in class, but coming, he, you know, he doesn't know anything about my class. It's just that our, a lot of people end up reverting back to these basic principles. And way too many of those people get there after they've left college and they've just experienced life. It wasn't anything they got in college. And that to me is, that's what I think is pretty awful. Um, but I know it's true. Um, all right, so one more thing is about Southern Spain and how uh, 120 years after Muhammad died, not long after Muhammad died, there was a big fight between the Sunni and the Shia, right? This is, this is what Muslims care about, except when the Americans get so annoying, they all decide they're gonna hate Americans. Um, so it was either the Muhammad's brother or his daughter's husband were having this big fight right, for who gets to take over. And one of the families was actually massacring the other one in Damascus. And so this one guy escaped and he went to Southern Spain because his mother was from Morocco. So he knew there were some Muslims in that area. And so ever since that time, um, 750, which is not long in the course of history, not long after Muhammad died, um, he, he started this culture in Southern Spain and he wanted it to be tolerant because Damascus had been a tolerant city. So that was his model. And Mohammed has, had been tolerant. The um, Charter of Medina, where he gave Jews and Christians rights and protections. So obviously this would be his vision, right? That shouldn't be surprising. It, once you know the tradition. And he brought together rabbis, uh, priests, and imam to do a translation project. So they translated the Old and New Testaments into Arabic. And that was just year after year, generation after generation. That was the real commitment. So everyone who came to that area, grew up in the area, had read all of these books in the same language so they could understand the commonalities, the common threads between them. Um, and that culture survived, even though that had its ups and downs, right? Because people are invading and, and it's, you know, people are doing all sorts of nasty stuff. Um, okay, so it had a thriving intellectual life. It integrated poetry with theology. It was assimilationist. Um, toleration was based on the Quran. Um, then the, there was a corruption of the history, right? Uh, stories started being told that were false. They were false. So the Syrians were trying to expand and there was a battle and um, the Franks tried to, to go south, but um, there was what? In okay, uh, it's just a long story. 
but it was based on lies. The Basques in the Pyrenees, these were Spanish people, and they attacked the um, French. But the story was that it was the Muslims that attacked, and that story just spread like wildfire, the strong uh, Song of Roland. It was false, but it created all this animosity between Christians and Muslims. Once again, it was the Spanish people. When the, when the French came in to try and conquer more of Spain, and then they were getting pushed back, it was the Spanish people that massacred the French. It was not the Muslims. But you could understand how easily that could happen. It could, it could be the rumor was, was Muslims. Obviously, the French were coming to conquer the Muslims. They didn't succeed. They got massacred. Oh, they must have been massacred by Muslims. Of course, except that it's not true. Okay, so, and then it, you know, it's what people wanted to believe. And so they believed it. <laughs> um, then, yeah, there was these problems that Christians would be, were annoyed because the Christians here in Southern Spain love to read the poems of the Arabs. Well, yeah, Shahrazad, those are cool stories. <laughs> um, okay, so all talented young Christians want, Arabic was the language of culture, right? If you really wanted to aspire to be educated, you learned Arabic. Um, but extremists would pervert that tradition, spread false rumors, blah, blah. It's such a long history. I, I, was, I was just thinking, how, where am I going to stop? Um, there's no way that I can um, describe all this stuff. But I just encourage you to read through it and realize that, see, Americans have such a short history and it's not, you know, it's not like other countries' history. Other countries, you're, you're invaded by these people and these people and these people. And, you know, most countries have, all, have borders with other countries and they're constantly being uh, invaded or colonized or, you know, there's just, borders are a big deal. Geopolitics means your geography determines your politics. Americans are incredibly isolated. They do not understand that. And it's a source of, of course, their ability not to have to deal with war, but it's also the source of their excess fear. Nobody, nobody in the world remotely thought that Saddam was going to go after Americans, except some Americans. If we don't bomb them, he's going to come get us. That's just completely ridiculous. And everybody else would know that because they know what it means to have somebody on your border coming after you. Whereas this little guy on the other side of the world, sorry, no. Um, so I don't think most people really believed that Americans believed we had to defend ourselves against Saddam because even though the president said it, um, because they would know how ridiculous that was. So they just assumed all Americans knew the reason was cheap oil. It was empire building because that was what the po political leaders um, had written a statement that that was their goal, but, but they didn't let Americans see it, right? That wasn't the political rhetoric. But anyway, the story of Southern Spain is the story of people coming and going. It's a much more common kind of history. Um, and then, of course, there's always a problem when you have one man setting this up and passing the legacy to his son. Well, the son might be corrupt. He might not have a son or the, the like an 11 year old uh, is supposed to take over and he's in the hand of a guardian and the chamberlain the guardian is corrupt and he takes over so that happens in any kind of monarchy um but again that isn't because islam is a bad religion um it's just because people 
power hungry people took advantage of situations. Um, the, no the Normans invaded in Sicily and they, um, they set up this Andalusian culture or they actually, they got co-opted. Like they liked this culture. It was a high level, had a lot of poetry and art, right? So, so that's how that uh, Arabian uh, Muslim culture got spread. Um, all right, let's see, let me just, oh, a couple under other things, the genre, genre of storytelling. He tells stories to his son, just like Socrates, just like Confucius, just like Buddha, right? It's the same education through story, storytelling. Once again, you know, and we have stories of Muhammad. That's the part that, you know, people remember. Then there is this awful animosity and people set up these stories about animosity. Extremists set up this story. Um, okay, so there's tolerant Christians versus intolerant. There's tolerant Muslims versus intolerant. Um, what I wanted to get to was um, Ferdinand and Isabella, right? 1492, 1492, okay. So this is so interesting. I don't want you to see it. It's so amazing. When I read this, I thought, why am I not taught this? So then you realize your education is a kind of indoctrination. Okay. So in 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella took over the monarchy and they had told the Jews that they would tolerate them, okay? Now, when they took over, so much for that, they start persecuting Jews. So the Jews are trying to get out of there as fast as they can. And um, Christopher Columbus, in the meantime, wanted to try to find a new route to India. Now, this is the kicker. He, he thought India would have spices, right? That's what he wanted to make some money. Um, but any country with spices would be elevated. It would be cultured. It would have a high level of culture because, you know, spices are a luxury. They would not be living at this primitive level. So that's what he expected. And based on his experience in Spain, if you are cultured, you speak Arabic. So he figured the people in India would speak Arabic. So he, he hired or he brought on a, um, um, a Jewish, what do they call Jewish minister? Um, anyway, a Jewish leader, religious leader, because he knew Arabic. <laughs> I think that's great. That it's just hired refugee Jews who knew Arabic. They were on the Santa Maria. And it's just that should blow your mind that you'd really need to have a different picture. <laughs> I mean, we already have this picture that Columbus, you know, wasn't the big hero and the Native Americans and all. I mean, we have, we've had re, a more accurate descriptions of Columbus and the effects and all that stuff. But um, this one is also part of the rewrite. Like you have to get your facts straight. We didn't have that straight. Um, then in the 13th century, there were two major Aristotle's works were discovered. And there were two guys in Southern Spain who, who wrote commentaries on Aristotle and they completely wove together Islam with Aristotle, Aristotle's virtues. Like you should know that it wouldn't be that hard, but at the time it was very radical. And then after they had done their work, there was this big fight between them and a more fundamentalist literalist who said, no, no, you know, Aristotle's the antichrist. These guys are heretics. 
and the, the guy who accused them of being heretical won out, right? It was that branch of Islam that started to dominate. Um, yeah, the conflict among Muslim intellectuals. So that was a big problem. And then St. Thomas Aquinas also unified um, Aristotle with Christianity. So again, you have this huge synthesis that went on right about the same time, Andalusia. Aquinas was educated in Southern Italy, right? So Aquinas is the one that knew that Islam could be linked to Aristotle. So of course, Christianity can be linked to Aristotle. And he knew how, he knew those virtues. Um, and then there was, um, okay. So the Jewish mystical Judaism also was um, trying to synthesize these religions. The legacy of the tradition is science, the betrayal of the tradition. Um, and let's see, okay, it's against extremism. Then in the Black Death, they wanted to find a scapegoat. So Southern Spain, right? It's because of those people that were too tolerant. That's why God brought the back Black Death. It's exactly what Jerry Falwell said. It's because of those dang liberals. God allowed 9-11 to happen. It's, it's just amazing. <laughs> um, Solomon Rushdie, Sarajevo. Um, let's see. So September 11th, beginning a new chapter in this animosity. We're repeating the same mistakes. It's always possible to choose toleration. And then I say that Indonesia, you know, is good in the sense that it's tolerant. Um, but actually in Indonesia, there's a lot of problems with it. Um, the contribution of the Greeks. So that's my thing, right? That it provides a bridge. Um, it gives a vision of the human condition. Good, bad, ugly, you name it. It's comprehensive, incorporates all aspects of culture. And that's why I like it. Um, so that is, I'm sure, enough to should keep you happy and busy. Um, so those are the themes I want you to bring up. So, so on Monday, you must, we'll start out with Perda. Everybody, we do one round of that. Then we do terrorism. We do one round of that. Then we do identity politics. I think I'll go around a few on that. The rest will be optional. If you want to, if you want to discuss the fatalism and resilience outline, or this idea about recruiting high school kids. Do you have high school kids who are generally some, a lot of times they're lonely, they're kind of loners. And then these more rigid religion, let's get back to Christianity, provides a nice stable social group, right? An identity. So that the, this one about high school kids goes back to this, outline about identity, people needing a sense of identity. So that's what we will do. And a reminder about organizing um, how you're going to take your incompletes, or I am not going to read a whole biograph in one day. So <laughs> that's the end of that. Okay.